Thursday, two of my grandkids showed up, I opened the door up. I saw them, I said, I told you the gym was closed two weeks, just shut the door in their face, opened the door. And then about a quarter of seven, we got finished playing ball, so I stand before you the cripple that I am today. Boy, I tell you what, I can't believe, I can't believe how bad I still feel today. But anyway, then after what we went through yesterday with the other grandkids, that's just part of life, is it not? Tell you what we're going to be at today, and what we're going to be at, Lord willing, weeks to come. Let's look into Scripture about what God talks about the laws of harvest and the, the sower's promise. And the reason why I bring this up, you see a lot of these things in Scripture about planting, about reaping, about watering. It doesn't say anything about you and I preparing the ground. And the reason why it really doesn't say anything about us. And you know, a farmer today before he plants will probably spend more time preparing the ground for the planting than it actually takes time to plant. All right? Now here's the deal. All that preparation and getting this, the ground ready for the seeds about to be sown. The farmer may have the intention to plant this particular seed, but any seed you put in there might, might grow. When God prepares the heart to be receptive, don't you think our enemy doesn't know that? So what I want us to do today is to understand the laws of, of, of harvest and how that you and I might be able to, to be better prepared for the task that is before us. Now, there is a reason Bill mentioned about no friend day cards, no stars, all that stuff that we used to do in the past, we didn't do it this year, there is a reason for that. And he brought this up not too long back, and maybe it just kind of uh, slid by us, but all the preparation that you might want to try to do for Friend Day, which happens one time a year, is something that we need to do every week. So if we're able to, to get individuals in here next Sunday, what keeps us from doing the very same thing the Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. You see, we need to focus in on what the Bible says about sowing. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. It simply says this, be not deceived. Why did Paul write that to these churches in Galatia? I'll tell you why. It's because he knew who the deceiver was. Paul himself, being a Pharisee of the Pharisees and yet blinded by the from the love of Christ, he didn't understand how deceived he was until actually when he came to the saving knowledge of Christ. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Mark it down on your calendar. This is one particular thing you can count on. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Law number one is where we'll be at today and even next week. We reap only what has been sown. Whatever you put in the ground, you're going to get that same type of seed back. He says in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15 through 17, See that you walk circumspectly, that you walk uprightly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And then the psalmist says in Psalms 9 and 12, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Life is filled with choices, is it not? Sure it is. And the choices that are made will affect us and others. We agree with that. Now, this series of messages is not meant to intimidate us from keeping from making choices because when we decide not to make a choice, we made a choice. So, what we're trying to do, we're trying to Use the phrase, redeem the time. 
take advantage of the days that God has given us and then we choose wisely in making those type of choices. So let's just look quickly. Blessings that we reap because of what God has done on our behalf. Let's just look at some of those real quick. The blessings, remember, something is sown, something's about to be reaped. So let's look at these blessings that you and I have received because of what God has done on our behalf. So we look at all of humanity, and the scripture says this in Matthew 5, 45. Oh my God, He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain to the just and unjust alike. So we look at what, what we call you know, God's common grace. This is the positive side about sowing and reaping. You know, this is what we call the, the, the very common grace of God that God bestows grace upon all of mankind. But wait a minute. Acts 17, 28 says this. This is when Paul was preaching, and he was preaching in Athens, Greece. He was preaching to people that knew nothing about God, even though they worshiped other gods. And he says this in him, we, he says, me and you included. He says that we live and we move and we have our very being because of God's common grace. But then let's, let's narrow that grace down to a specific grace. Blessings that we have received on the behalf that God has planted on, on our behalf. Let's look at salvation grace. Well, in looking at a passage of scripture that probably identifies that salvation grace would be John 3.16. You know, because we know that God did love the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We see the blessings of this type of grace in order to be saved. Now, these are things that God has done for all of mankind in general. And then you can take that saving grace and been, narrow it down to those that have used or have reached out and allowed God to use that grace specifically to save us. Now here, though, is where I really want to get specific. We're looking at blessings that you and I receive based on what others have done in our behalf. I want to dwell on the positive today. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of John, chapter 4. And, and, and I just want to read what Jesus has already said. Now, remember, John, chapter 4 is where Jesus had went through Samaria. There he had visited the, the woman at the well in Samaria. There's, this, this is not an accident that happened. Jesus had this planned. And then there was some conversation that took place after the disciples came back and, and they saw what was going on. Jesus said something in verse number 38, or excuse me, verse number 35 through 30. Notice what he says. Say not ye, there are yet four months And then harvest. Fellas, and when did you say the harvest time was going to come? You know, the, one of the first things that took place in, 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 the, in the harvest of, of the Jews, the first, the first thing to come off was the, the barley harvest. There were different harvests in different parts of the year and different parts of the country based upon the altitude where they lived. He says, fellow, I want you to look at something. It's important. If you just stop, and I'm going to paraphrase this, I'm looking at something that you don't see. 
Because I'm seeing a harvest that is just, it's just white, it's just, it's just ready to be gathered. So let's ask ourselves a question real quick. He's telling the disciples that a harvest is there. He's also about to tell the disciples they had nothing to do with planting what is about to be gathered. He said, I want you to lift up your eyes and look. You're going to, you're going to gather. You're going to gather a, a crop in where you had no part in sowing at all. You didn't plant the crop, but yet you're going to gather the crop. was Jesus talking about? Well, hey, let's just, let's stop. We are here today at this, at this particular place because of what was started years before our even existence upon the earth. There are churches that are worshiping today because of someone's faithfulness centuries ago. Because they had so much faith that they began to sow, and years and years later, a generation or generations later, they're still reaping the harvest from what was sown years ago. And this is what Jesus is saying right here. All he was saying is that you need to be aware that the crop is in the field. Turn to the book of Deuteronomy, if you will. Chapter number, chapter number 6. Deuteronomy chapter number 6. In this particular chapter, what God is trying to express to the people of Israel through the mouth of Moses is what they are, are going to receive. Remember, God said, I have prepared a particular place for the people of Israel that, I, that had been in bondage for 400 years in the land of Egypt. I freed you. Now this is what I'm going to give you. And he says this. And it shall be when the Lord thy God, verse number 10, it shall be when the Lord thy God hath brought you unto the land, which he swear unto your forefathers like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, to give great and goodly cities that you did not build. And I'm going to give you houses full of good things that you didn't fill up. I'm going to give you wells that you didn't dig. I'm going to give you vineyards and fig trees that you didn't plant. Then it says, when you've, when you've eaten, make sure, make sure you don't forget who did this for you. Now that's important. Now, I paraphrase that, but listen. You and I, here's the fact. We are blessed today because others have done a lot of work. And here comes the harvest. Now, I know for a fact, a farmer would love to harvest every month of the year. That's where the payoff is. Every month of the year, instead of doing all that work starting in late fall and then in the spring and working all the way through until the harvest season finally gets here, and the harvest season is so short compared to all the other hours put in. And yet Jesus telling his disciples, you know what? Here you are. You're at a good time. Just look. Well, I say this to us, just as Jesus said to his disciples, let's look. There are a lot of folks way before we got here put in a lot of hard work so that you and I could reap what has been sown. We've been blessed on the behalf of others. We need to look. And we didn't do as, as, as God commanded the people of Israel to do. Make sure you don't forget this. 
Beware if we, when we forget it, when we forget it, when we forget it, we're in trouble. That's the fact. Now let's use an illustration quickly. If you and I would actually do a study of Western civilization, look at our our country for just a few moments. We will admit the blessing that we have enjoyed, such as, and let me mention those blessings, freedom, law, and the opportunity to minister to those in need. Did you hear those three things? We're talking about freedom, law, and the opportunity to minister to those that are in need. If we studied those closely, Western civilization, and see the and see what's happening in our in our nation. You cannot but believe this, that those are the byproducts of Christianity that comes from our godly heritage. You cannot deny that fact. Willing to help those that are hurting. Law that governs ourselves. And freedom. There was a weekly magazine that was published in this country starting in 1826, ending in 1973. It was called The Christian Advocate. It was actually an old Methodist Episcopal Church newspaper that started publishing in New York City. And one of their ancient publications This was what it said, and I quote, America rests upon four cornerstones. And it named the four cornerstones. The English Bible, the English language, the common law, and the tradition of liberty. But liberty and our language and the law might have been drawn from the Bible alone. But even if we only brought one thing over from the motherland, even if we just brought just one thing over, and that was the good book, America would still have been great. Because without the book, America could not have been and be what she is today. Without its guidance and wisdom. And when she loses that, America will cease to become. Question, the freedom that so many people reach after. They don't understand what they're searching for. Did we bring the Bible to these shores or did it bring our forefathers here? Think about that for just a moment. It has been said that South America was settled by the Spanish who came to that land in search for gold. But North America was settled by the pilgrims who came in search of religious freedom. Hence the difference between the two worlds. We've seen the blessings that God has given us on our behalf. We've seen the common grace, and we've seen the salvation grace. And we've mentioned right now some of the positive things, some of the positive things that, that have been passed down from generation to generation, given to, to us in our behalf. And just as Jesus said to those disciples, look around. Don't take for granted. Look around. Somebody else done this work. Nation of Israel, when you walk into that house and it's fully furnished and you go to those cupboards and you open it up and it's full of all the things you need, remember, it is I that gave that to you. You had nothing to do with it. 
when we really lose the respect for the word, when we really lose respect for the law, when we lose respect for liberty, we've lost everything. Now let's look at the application quickly. I've often wondered do we really understand how far reaching the choices that I make today how far reaching those 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 choices that I make will will Will, will affect someone that I'll never ever see. Children, family members, co workers, friends. And then there was a passage of scripture that we find in 2 Timothy 2 and 2 as. Paul was being very specific, making sure everything that he says in this letter was well thought about because it was his last letter to Timothy prior to his death. And he said, Timothy, the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall be able to to teach others. Now notice, I've talked about we have, we have harvested the good things that others have sown. We have reaped. We have gathered in our barns the good things that our, that our founding fathers and loved ones prior to us have, have, have faithfully sown. That's what we've talked about. And just as you and I have faithfully sown good things, those that come after us, as Paul said, as Paul said, I have sown faithfully, faithful things, and I'm, and I'm passing these things on to faithful men that are going to be able to do the same thing. We talk about these great and good things week after next is a different picture. Because you see, even though we may reap the right that others have sown, in this nation and in the lives of men, women, boys, and girls, sometimes we reap the wrong that others have sown. That's sad, isn't it? Well, can't we just stop here, preacher, and let's just focus on those great good things. That's true. Jesus said, look, the harvest is out there. It's white. It's out there. But Jesus also knew the disciples couldn't even see one harvest, and yet Jesus could see two. So it's only right if we, if we dwell upon the positive that we need to talk about the negative. You know why we need to talk about the negative? Because they make the positive look so much better. His bowed eyes closed.